Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Certainly wonderful to see you all. Uh, we had a little break, but uh, it's time to continue again as we uh, try to finish out the year. Um, we have a few sessions, and then uh, we'll be taking a break again on the last Monday. We'll go ahead and open up with a word of prayer before we get started. Um, Brother Frank Martin, do you think you can open us up with a word of prayer? All right. <clears throat> our Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, again, we come to thee with thanksgiving for thy word that reveals to us thy love and plan for man upon earth, reveals the person and work of our Lord Jesus and the accomplished work at Calvary that our Savior himself alone can do. And we thank thee that we can now rejoice in our risen Savior, the one who is seated at thy right hand, awaiting the moment in which he will come again and claim his purchased possessions to be with him forever. And so, our Father, we pray the blessing upon thy word as we have gathered virtually this evening to hear more of what our Lord has prepared for us and who the Lord Jesus is and what he continues to do in this present day. With, with thanksgiving, our Father, we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Okay, well, this evening we have a very important topic that, uh, that we will be discussing. And if you saw the flyer, then you know that Biblical and social justice is uh, what's on the table today. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to start with this topic, and don't know how long uh, this will take us. Um, and we want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions and, and uh, follow-up comments and so on from both brothers. Uh, so we're going to start this evening with uh, this topic of biblical and social justice and it is ever important to us and, and pertinent to our day in life now. As so much is going on around us, we know this is a very uh, important topic to so many. So I want to start with uh, Dr. Alexander Kudian. Uh, we'll follow up with Dr. John Matthew a little bit later. But I want to start with Dr. Alexander Kudian this evening. Uh, brother, can you go ahead and explain to us this very uh, important and difficult topic to, uh, to tread, biblical and social justice? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. And uh, good that we could uh, gather together again this uh, evening. Uh, the social justice has become a very hot topic and a very popular topic today. And many people, both in the church, in politics and outside the church, and also political activist groups, all of them discuss this. And even many of our young people are also very enthusiastic about it. And uh, that, that's all good. There is nothing wrong because uh, we are facing so many uh, social uh, issues and so, so much uh, injustice is found in our society. So as God's people, we, we think always differently from the world or we have to. You know, we cannot imitate the world and we cannot go after the popular ideologies of the world. And uh, even if uh, many people in the world are doing these things with good intention, uh, you know, they are not spiritually enlightened. Uh, they still have a depraved mind. Uh, this is not to condemn them in any way, because they do not have the Spirit of God in them. And uh, the things of God are foolishness to them still. So uh, they cannot think, uh, you know, in terms of God's kingdom agenda, if I can use that word. You know, God's kingdom is only coming in the future, literal kingdom. We are a part of the spiritual kingdom, that is the church. We have been redeemed from the kingdom of darkness and we have been placed in the kingdom of his dear son. And that kingdom of his dear son has in, he is related to the church today. So even as the body of Christ, we are inseparably related to God's kingdom agenda, which will be literally established, you know, in the future. And... Uh, 
only in the only in God's kingdom when it is established on this earth that uh, all the uh, injustice and all the problems related to that will be eradicated until that day uh, we have to live with it. So we cannot be, so that is my first proposition, that is, we cannot be too much optimistic about these things. As long as we are in a fallen world and as long as uh, Satan is ruling all the systems of this world, including all socio-economic political systems, it will be under his clutches, under his direction. And that will impact our political leaders, our social activists, you know. So uh, we, we cannot, you know, think about, we, we should not think that we will be, uh, that we have to be very optimistic. That is my first proposition, that we cannot be over optimistic. These social injustice problem will be here as long as man is here and it will be all around us, and many a times we will be quite helpless. That is my second proposition. That is, we may be quite helpless in eradicating or uh, resolving or solving these problems. The third one, so I already made two propositions. The third one, the Bible very clearly speaks about these things, especially in the prophetic books. God is for social justice. He wants his people to raise their voice against social injustice. And God commanded the prophets to raise their voice against social injustice during their lifetime. And when God's chosen people, Israel, when they were insensitive to the needs of the people around them, those who are suffering from social injustice, God also warned them that if they are insensitive to the needs of the people around them, that God's blessing will not be upon them. So, you know, we, we find these things uh, in the prophetic books, especially in Isaiah, but if you are particularly interested, you will find more themes related to social justice in the prophecy of Amos and Micah. You know, they are probably the specialists in this area. But you will find it in other books like in, uh, today I was reading like Isaiah 58. God is, um, you know, rebuking the children of Israel uh, for their uh, religiosity of fasting and prayer without being sensitive, sensitive to the needs of others. So our God is for social justice and he wants his people also to stand for social justice and do whatever we can to help the people who are victims of social injustice. So that is something which we can clearly establish from the word of God. But again, there are many situations in which we may be helpless. Our voice may not be heard, that we may not be able to push things too much. And we must also know that we may have to live with it in this fallen world. And one day the Lord will come and he will, you know, uh, fix this problem. But at the same time, we cannot be escapist and we cannot abandon our responsibilities in this area. So that is the first, uh, you know, uh, that is the, these are some of the most important observations I want to make by way of introduction. Now, the second thing which uh, I would like to highlight is this is where I have differences. I, I feel that, you know, I cannot agree with many of these social activist, social justice groups today because uh, their social justice concept is only related to uh, life, especially life of certain 
you know, groups of people or certain uh, class of people or race of people, uh, the reason may be that they may be undergoing more injustice. So they they may have a reason to do that, definitely. So we, we have to admit that. But I believe what the Bible encourages us or teaches is that, uh, number one is that all lives matter and all lives deserve social justice. All lives, you know. So it is not to one segment of society. One segment may be probably more victimized or in some places, you know. I believe it is no may not be widespread everywhere, but this is a universal problem all over the world. Certain segments of the society may be more victimized or marginalized and their voice is not heard and they go through all this. So it is a universal problem. And uh, whether it is democratic country, socialist country, the communist countries which say that they are for the people, even in those countries, we see, you know, more problems uh, than in democratic countries, you know, in relation to social justice. So uh, we have to know that all lives matter and some groups might have been more oppressed than uh, others, but uh, we have to look at this uh, as, uh, you know, recently in some of my talks in some assemblies and in some messages, which I mentioned this, that uh, we have to be more concerned about social justice from, from womb to the tomb, you know, and from birth to death. So what about the millions of children, babes in the womb, who are mercilessly aborted and they do not get any justice? So today's philosophy of social justice is only for adult life, you know, it is not from womb to tomb. I believe in social justice from womb to tomb, from birth to death, and from all classes of people, and all lives matter. Those are some of the fundamental issues, and today, even people who are very active in these fields, uh, they do not want to listen to uh, these propositions, you know, uh, because their understanding of social justice is very, very limited. And uh, uh, God is out of that. It is very anthropocentric. It is man-centered. So that also we cannot subscribe, you know. We can only subscribe we are for these things, for these matters, because God wants us to be the salt of the earth and light of the world. You know, that verse uh, comes to my mind from the book of James, chapter 2. Uh, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, uh, James 1.27 to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unsupported from the world. Another very direct statement in the New Testament about caring for the oppressed, you know, because during James's time, the widows and the orf orphans comprise the most neglected segment of society. So James is calling believers that your religion has to be demonstrated in helping these people who are oppressed. So that's in the New Testament. And we are called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And we have to be witnesses of the love and grace of God. So all these things directly or indirectly show us our uh, responsibility. So, uh, you know, social justice has lost its definition and clarity today. That is, Another very important observation. It is very biased. It's very politically oriented. It is very racially motivated. 
And uh, in all the talks, usually 99% of the talks in relation to racial, uh, sorry, social injustice, it all breeds toxicity, you know, and uh, it breeds more dividing, pulling down of moral laws and violation of law. How can that be justice, you know? So, because people want to get the applause of the larger society and they don't want to be in the bad book of everyone and want to be politically correct, you know, uh, they don't mention these things because the moment you mention these things, people think that, or oh, you don't have any concern for others, you know. So, there is a lot of violence and lot of violation of law in the name of justice, securing justice. So we cannot operate outside of God's truth, you know. So our approach is theocentric, God-centered, not man-centered. It is logocentric. It is word-centered. It is centered on God's revelation of the truth of God. It is Christ-centered, Christocentric too, because we want to engage in such activities for the glory of our Savior. So, so, so this is the framework in which we must operate, and this is the only framework in which we can operate. And, uh, when we want to operate in some, in this framework, people don't want to listen to us. So we do not have a platform or we do not uh, get a platform because our ideology is very different. Do you think that I will get a good platform to say these things in the social justice movement today? No, I won't. The, the reason is, uh, <laughs> Even though I'm sympathetic, I'm supportive, I'm for it because our Lord, our God's word, everything is for it. And uh, gospel is the gospel of love and grace and forgiveness. So it is the top list in the gospel. But why we are not heard or why people do not want to listen to us? The reason is we do not take an anthropocentric approach. We take a logo-centered, word-centered, Christ-centered, and theocentric approach. So it becomes increasingly difficult for Christians to make their voices heard collectively in relation to uh, social justice issue, even though we would like to uh, uh, do that. So these are some of the uh, practical problems uh, which uh, we face uh, in the world today as we strive to help others uh, in this uh, in this uh, area. One, uh, one more thing uh, before I turn over to Dr. John Matthew. Um, <coughs> uh, some of the things which we find today uh, in the world, in the name of uh, uh, social justice, or, you know, it is like a firm life policy, you know, that is our approach to should be like a whole life policy, that is for the whole man, from birth to death, in all various aspects of his life, uh, we should show, we should help them to be uh, faithful citizens uh, of their country and to um, help their society uh, without being, without uh, breeding any kind of prejudice or without uh, breeding any kind of uh, uh, partiality. So uh, social engagements and community related services joining hands with uh, other evangelical <laughs> Christians also is a good thing you know, and uh, I'm for it. I, I encourage a lot of people to do that, 
you know, especially many of my young friends uh, who have influential positions in their job place or in the society. But many a times, as I told you, because we operate on two different ideologies, the biblical ideology of social justice, the world hates and the world uh, does not want to accept that. Since that is a practical issue we face, what we can do in this matter also is relatively uh, negligible, I would say, or relatively uh, very, very minor. But individually, if any one of us can do more, that is well and good. But based on biblical ideology and principles and not compromising with the world's ideology of social justice, I do not know how far in the present society we will be able to do anything uh, very effectively. But individually, we can. We can show sympathy, kindness, we can pray, we can help, we can be good friends with others, we can welcome others, and uh, we can help others, and uh, we can befriend others uh, to make sure that we don't have any kind of racial prejudice or we are sympathetic to people who go through you know, uh, concerns of social uh, injustice, and we can pray for them. And individually, we may be able to do more things than collectively, because collectively, in any forum, uh, the, uh, the biblical ideology is not welcomed. So I hope uh, my insight will be helpful to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, brother. So just want to bring back a few points that I picked up on at least. Um, and uh, just to be brief, and then I have a, a, a question or two just in follow up. So you mentioned God's position versus the world's position. And then you later uh, alluded to uh, essentially the world and Satan being together. So would I be correct in saying that it's God's position versus Satan's position? Yes, yes, very that, much okay. so. Yeah. Okay. You, so you then talked about, go ahead. Uh, maybe, you no, know, to put it, God's kingdom agenda versus Satan's kingdom agenda. And that is the conflict which we are seeing. So it's a spiritual part of the spiritual warfare also. Yes. Okay. And you then mentioned that, um, that we should not be optimistic. And I, I think I'm quoting that correctly, but I want to uh, maybe word that a little differently and tell me if this is, uh, would make sense to you. That we should be realistic versus optimistic about the resolution for this age at this time prior to the kingdom. Would that be, uh, yes. would that make sense? Th that is true. Yes, I use okay. the word optimistic only in relation to the present society and what we see today. Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, so I have a, a specific question or, uh, you know, a question about how we can apply this. So you mentioned that, um, uh, that we need to obviously be uh, word centric and Christ centric in our understanding and application. And you then gave some, some ways that we can apply what you have mentioned. But uh, more specifically, can you maybe um, give us an idea of what would not be appropriate? So let's just take one of these issues and, and maybe we can look at it that way. Uh, so maybe abortion as an example, right? What's something that you would say would, would not be appropriate? And I know it's, you know, this, there's a lot to discuss here, but uh, we see what's happening in the news and how people are handling this situation. Uh, so is there something that uh, that maybe would be less appropriate for a believer to do uh, and still be word or Christ centric? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think, you know, uh, we all are called to be agents of change and healing and righteousness and kindness and mercy uh, in our life, you know. And uh, so that is why I find that 
this is in the present world and in the system in which we are living uh, it is we can practice this more in a more on an individual basis you know uh, in relation to our neighbors and in relation to people we come in contact with the poor and the needy and the oppressed uh, consoling them, comforting them, encouraging them, uh, declaring solidarity with them in their struggle and to let them know that we are for them and uh, we would do anything we can to help them, that we are not prejudiced in any way because uh, we believe in the gospel in Christ. So our message is always the message of love and hope and healing. So, but if we go, in my experience, when we go that, when we take that to a platform in the world, you know, in a social activist platform or a political platform or a social justice platform, the world doesn't want to hear what I have to further say about it, you know. They want to, they, they probably welcome the first part, the love and grace, tolerance, love, all those things, because, you know, tolerance is the greatest virtue today. So, so then when we go to de define what is sin and what is tolerance, then the world doesn't want to hear. So brothers and sisters, I think we, we may be able to get involved in this struggle, maybe more individually, you know, fulfilling our responsibilities and being good witnesses of the Lord. But wherever we can, we can also do collectively. But in that area, I'm not very hopeful or not very um, optimistic, realistically speaking. <laughs> yes, no, I understand. Uh, I think it's clear for us to understand that that. Uh, we see the world as it appears to be falling apart, but in fact, it's uh, falling into place according to the Lord's plan. So I think that's important for us to understand. Uh, Dr. John Matthew, I know that, um, you know, this is a subject that uh, you're very well familiar with. Um, you have a few books that are written on similar topics and covering some of these uh, ideals. So do you have something you would like to add to add to to follow up or uh, anything else before we go ahead and take questions on this? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good evening, brothers and sisters, and I thank the Lord for this opportunity. I just uh, uh, have a request. You know, I have been suffering from flu lately uh, since uh, heavy medicated. <laughs> so please pray for my well being and uh, appreciate your prayers and. Uh, Thank uh, Dr. Alexander for choosing this subject. This is a most important subject. Uh, we should have uh, talked this before. And uh, as we Indian immigrants, I came and the Indian immigrants uh, came from India, uh, from a socialist countries. It's a free country, America, a capitalist country. So we can flourish here with the freedom uh, and the free enterprise. Unfortunately, uh, we provided for our children, and our second generation children, many of them are in high clan of American society, and uh, they make uh, 100000 to 300000 uh, dollars per year. And uh, some of them, unfortunately, they support Black uh, Lives Matter and Antifa, and they say that, you know, we, ha we have to embrace a, a part of socialism and uh, give money for the poor people. And uh, it's really disturbed my mind, you know. So I see a great omission and a colossal failure of the on the part of their parents or our Christian parents and local assemblies. So they were never taught how to apply biblical principles with the economics and sociology and history. So Ronald Reagan stated, you know, the best so social program is social justice is given employment for a unemployed person, uh, give a job. And he also stated a Democratic Party, the leftists, they spend a lot of money for poor people. And uh, he did not question their intention. They had a good heart. They did a good, with a good heart, but not with a good head. So same way our young people, 
believe that although they are educated and they make a lot of money, they think that we should take some of the money and give it to just poor people. That means uh, liberals think that uh, most of the solution for the problems are maladies, you know, it's uh, spend money. For example, if the children are failing in school, do more money for the school. So that's the solution, throw money. So this word is a magical word for political progressive and young Christian believers. This concept of fairness and social justice and equality can be seen in Genesis chapter 3, verse 3. You are familiar, I am going to read it. Did God, a serpent asked, did God really say you must not eat from the tree, any tree in the in the garden? And then verse 4, if you read it there, a serpent is advising you how to become an equal to God. That means uh, Satan, serpent, so an inequality for Eve and how you can become equal to God and uh, advise them, them. This concept became an organized force in the 19th century with the birth of socialism and communism in Europe, uh, diam diametrically opposite to uh, the founding of American uh, democracy. Recently, social justice movement added many new issues, including, including climate change, racial equality, free health care, free education, free housing, basic level of monthly income, and LGBTQ rights. That's, that means lesbians and queer. If you read Communist Manifesto or the Manifesto of the Bolshevik Revolution and the today's uh, Progressive Manifesto or the agenda platform of the some American party, you will see the exact copy of copy of this Communist Manifesto. The latest addition are Black Lives Matter, it's Antifa. So Antifa means anti-fascist, sounds very loving. But if you know the history, if you watch the news last six months, what happened? Dutton cities were burned down by Antifa and beat up other people. So the name is reminiscent of the names of some communist countries, People's Republic of China, People's Republic of Korea. So you go and um, talk to Korea, talk against uh, Kim Jong-un, you will see uh, tomorrow the day they, that person is go going to say, uh, see the day after. So People's Republic, so you can provide any name. People, uh, so climate change is another latest. Environmentalism is another religion. When we, when I came here, I know that uh, every day news and everything, you know, so the, the world is going for climate cooling, you know, cooling age. A Time magazine had a, you know, so front of global cooling warning about. So they wanted United States of America eliminates all cars planes and factories, and uh, cows also. So there's a, I, I don't understand. United States is not the world. How you eliminate the cars and the factories and everything in United States, how you can clean the air in the universe. I remember a fact here when they say that, when I moved to the subdivision, I, we had some mosquito problem. Uh, and uh, I bought some spray, expensive spray from Home Depot and I sprayed in the front yard and backyard and everything, but the problem did not go away. So the Facebook, if you saw a neighborhood, uh, uh, we had a Facebook page, uh, they also, the neighbors also complaining the same thing. I know that it's a area problem. So what did I do? I called the, uh, the Montgomery County Mosquito Department and I asked them to come and they came with a special truck and sprayed. So that when they treated the whole area, the problem was over, not my house alone. So the same way when you come there, if you clean the air in the United States alone by eliminating all the cows and planes and factories, how you are going to clean the whole world? You know, you tell me the logic, insanity about it. Um, you know, the, how, much, uh, how much area you, USA has, it, three million square miles. Russia, for example, 6.6 .6 million square miles. And the Soviet Union before that, 8.6 million square miles. And China, including Tibet, more than 4 million square miles. Even Canada is larger than USA, 3.8 million square miles. Brazil and Australia are the same size of USA, almost 3 million square miles. India, 1.2 million square miles. So third, Africa and Asia, unless they clean the air, 
the, the, you are not going to eliminate the problem from the universe by cleaning the air. You know that the air and the water in America is the cleanest in the at present in the world. Even the Paris Agreement, you know, the 10 years after China had to start eliminating all the carbon. And we have to start right away. So that means the globalists want to bring down the United States of America. So there are two major scientists in the world right now added with uh, Al Gore. Now I call them time variety. The uh, Swedish teenager, uh, Greta Thunberg, and she became, although she is uh, mentally challenged, she became a leader of the climate group at age 15. And the other person is a former bar bartender, uh, Alexandria Cortez. So these three people are leading, and they gave us 12 years for the world to, to exist. So it's already 10 and a half years now, you know, unless we do something, the world is going to end. We have been hearing this last 50 years, world is going to end. Within 2006, Al Gore had a movie, Inconvenient Truth, you know, within uh, after 2012, you know, the Arctic is going to melt and all these things. And another group also is a cancel culture. This, if you say anything against our thing, we are going to cancel, going to silence you. So what is the social justice? Social justice is socialism. We had a preview about socialism when he had a coronavirus, uh, uh, empty shelves, uh, limits on purchase, long lines, and limit for the right of worship. So socialism is the big lie of the 20th century. However, they are very truthful in their policies. One, one thing, they always fulfill their promise. They promise the elimination of income inequality. Yes, they have done this, uh, that, the promise for the last one and years. Everyone in a socialist country become poor and uh, they share the miseries equally. So Margaret Thatcher stated, the problem with the socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. Socialism will run smoothly for the initial few years until all the money is gone. If we confiscate 100% of wealth of Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, and other billionaires, we, have, we would have enough money to run the federal government about eight months. A Ponzi scheme or a chain letter initially succeed, but eventually collapse. A pyramid scheme is based on 40 principles. In socialist countries, one person may confiscate all the wealth, but uh, if 10 persons come to rob you, one person come to rob you, doesn't make any difference. You are the victim. Under socialism, a few people control the means of production, but under capitalism, we control the means of production. If you prefer a Lexus, Cadillac, a Benz, or Lincoln, Apple iPhone to Samsung Galaxy, you don't have to elect a person. You do it directly by paying for them. Here we see the secret of how those billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs got rich. We made them rich. So this is an interesting story. In the 80s and 90s, I knew about hundreds of companies and their chairmen and presidents. It is, I advise everyone to read the biography of Steve Jobs. So Steve Jobs, 1980s, he started Apple Computer. And then his best friend was the chairman of Pepsi-Cola, uh, John Scully. And uh, he was like a brother. They used to have lunch uh, daily or weekly, weekend get together. And he always asked uh, John Scully, come and work for Apple. And John Scully said, you know, I am the chairman. I have the mansion. I have private plane. And I have more than enough money. I don't need to. You know, it's, it's not attractive for me. But Steve Jobs said one statement made him to think I'm to Apple. Uh, uh, John, you rest of your life, you can sell sugar water. But if you come to Apple, you are going to transform the world. You are going to change the universe. Now, you know that uh, that made John Scully to come to Apple, and he became the chairman, unfortunately. And uh, uh, he didn't agree with uh, Steve Jobs uh, later on, and uh, John Scully fired, dismissed uh, Steve Jobs. And then, you know, the story, you know, Apple computer went down and they had to bring back um, Steve Jobs. And now I, I don't have to explain where is Apple before Amazon. Apple was the largest company in the universe. Now, you know, the rest of the story. 
the inequality that socialists complain about this result of popular by result of popular mandate free markets work by satisfying our wants and uh, most successful business people are those who anticipate our wants even before we have them no one wrote to steve jobs beforehand to make a phone that could email take photos and gps and uh, stream movies i don't remember when steve jobs uh, came back to apple i don't i didn't write a letter to steve jobs i, I don't believe Alex, uh, dr alexander gudan wrote a letter to steve jobs and frank martin or call uh, anybody wrote a steve jobs to do this no uh, he conceived it and built it before we know we couldn't live, live without it so capitalism itself is a form of social justice the socialist system is built upon immorality of theft take from one and give it to another socialism is unnatural all things in the nature are capitalistic can uh, can i tell the oak tree in my i have a oak tree in my front front yard i cannot tell the oak tree how much water and nutrition it can take and uh, a squirrel comes and eat the nuts you know the seeds from there i cannot tell uh, the squirrel how many nuts uh it can uh, the squirrel can eat so all the living creatures work to produce a profit on their labors for their future capitalism may leave a few lazy people people at the bottom but socialism leaves everyone at the bottom in an ideal utopian world a socialism would be the best economic system however we forget that all humans are depraved in this fallen sinful world self interest is a virtue that exists to survive in this world consider a college classroom please pray attention you know the analogy i am going to say is very important students work hard to pass the examination the fruits of their labor can be seen in their grades suppose the professor were to say on the first day of class that in order to be fair to promote social justice he will assign grades by taking the average of the class and giving each the same grade in an ideal world all would study hard for the sake of learning to boost the average overall score of the class in reality we understand no student would study at all because no matter how hard he or she worked there would be no pay off of a higher grade the hardest working student uh, would complain bitterly bitterly about the professor's grading method and probably from the course in the same way socialism fails in the pursuit of ideals and noble goals of equality and justice its complete lack of incentive ignores the basic human nature actually self interest is the motivating factor of all human activities the success of capitalism lies in the fact that it recognizes the inherent human greed in all of us in all of us and harnesses it for the economic good for all students study hard in order to get a better jobs with a higher pay the business owners start business to make themselves more prosperous and investors create new products that improve the quality of life of for humanity driven by their desire for more wealth poverty and economic injustice exist because of capitalism is not applied properly so for example when 2008 financial crisis took place they blamed the capitalism so if you learn the history from 97 1976 from jimmy carter to bill clinton they intervened the government intervened so subprime mortgage rate was the reason for our collapse of 2008 they gave millions of people loans they could not qualify so bill clinton stated that uh, home ownership is not a privilege uh, it is a right it's not a privilege so asked the bank told the bank to give loans although they did not qualify so it had a domino effect so if if 1929 the great depression all the depression when it comes uh, they say that uh, it's capitalism is not working no capitalism is, will work if the economic problem happens 
where the government intervenes and the capitalist, capitalism is not applied properly. That's the reason we have economic calamities. Now, in this year, uh, January 20th, a new government may be taking over. And if they intervene in the free market economy more, you can watch if you are alive. This American economy with the world economy is going to collapse. So free market system, this is a system throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you can see that. Uh, it's a free market, not a government controlled mandate. Back to you, Raymond. Okay, brother. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's see if maybe I can uh, somewhat summarize that if, if this makes sense to you. I just want to ask this question. So are you saying that uh, the capitalistic market economy uh, promotes biblical and social justice? Is this, is this your uh, argument here? Yeah, do you remember the story about Jesus said about the ten talents, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. one we received five talents, and uh, and the other, you know, the person who received one talent, he he buried it, and then uh, you know the story, you know, the one who got the five talents, you know, he did business, and uh, made a ten more, so he was appointed for ten cities. The Jesus uh, was telling the person who received one talent, if you put that money in the bank, you should have a, you would have an end interest for that one. So the business enterprise, you know, including not only Jesus from Genesis to Revelation, you can see man is free and uh, you, you, you have incentive to do things and uh, leave people, the government leave people alone, take off from the back of the people and allow them to do their things instead of intervening. That's the biblical system. This talent example, you know, there are more, many more stories in the Bible. You can see that all free markets, capitalistic system, not any socialistic system in the scripture. Okay. So, uh, you know, I know, I know there was a lot said there and um, from both of these brothers. And I know there, there must be questions concerning both of these uh, this topic, but from both of these angles. Uh, so I want to open up for some questions right now. Uh, there's some some time left, um, and this is a topic that needs uh, needs more clarification. So does anybody have a question concerning this topic from either one of these angles that the two brothers presented? I do. Go ahead. So. Um... Would you consider the civil rights protests that happened in the 60s, in the 50s and the 60s as a legitimate form of social justice? Yeah, yeah, Jacob, that's a very appropriate uh, question. If you study the history, Martin Luther King was a Christian. He uh, he, he was for non-violence protest and he always, you know, rebuked uh, violence, you know. So that's the reason Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi of India uh, the the the, uh, the Martin Luther King uh, followed Mahatma Gandhi's non-violence ideal. Nelson Mandela also. So it was a civil protest, non-violent for the right. You know. So basically, just like Dr. Alexander also mentioned, you know, the people, you know, we are fallen, and the government, you know, sometimes, you know, they may not provide justice. But the, I think it was a legitimate uh, protest uh, by Martin Luther King and. Uh, and they received it. I think another thing also, and uh, we had a non-violence uh, protest by Mah Mahatma Gandhi in India, and uh, Gandhi himself admitted that if, if Hitler was there for India, you know, that non-violent uh, protest would not have taken place. He would have destroyed everyone within a few days. So, although America has failures, it, because of Christianity, they are, are concerned uh, it and uh, confessed it, and they gave freedom to uh, uh, to slaves and uh, and the white people. Uh, you, many people don't know. Seven hundred thousand white people died to give freedom to black people in the Civil War. And later on, you know, because of Christian culture, and uh, when Martin Luther and others uh, fought the Christian authorities, they allowed you know it, but. Now, you know, what is protesting, what is happening has no relation with the Martin Luther King's uh, protest. So I think it was a legitimate protest by Martin Luther King. I adore him and uh, and he was a great leader. So and I have Alexander, a... Alexander, I don't know. 
Yeah, I have a question that uh, we can use to kind of piggyback off of off of this question and response uh, that just came in. And the question is, is there a solution to racial injustice? And if so, what is it? Now, I, I, I'm asking this question with the view of what Dr. Alexander mentioned to begin with, that uh, we need to be realistic, right? Uh, we have to understand that, that uh, we are in a fallen world, that, that the world is under Satan's control at this point. So uh, with that in view, um, is there a solution? Oh, okay, Dr. Alexander, I, I hope he will explain. I want to just uh, to one minute to explain that. I have been speaking about that. When you are a good Christian, you don't need a law to how to treat women properly, how to treat other people. So when you preach gospel, when you, are, uh, when you, uh, when you become a new creation, you take care of other people. So in the past, look in America, before the government, you know, Christians and the churches took care of poor people. So this is the only solution. You, you don't need a, a law to, uh, to be nice to handicapped people or uh, mentally challenged people. So when you are transformed, you become a new creation, you treat everyone within with respect and uh, you don't need a women's right movement. And uh, for example, you know, that people with the uh, uh, the different sex and the various, you know, things. You don't have to. A, a, a good Christian will never uh, uh, do that. Uh, maybe they will never be rude and they will take care of them. So that's the solution. Propagate the gospel and uh, change the hearts of people. And uh, in, just, I think Alexander mentioned. Dr. Alexander mentioned that also individually. We 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 should be the agent of change. <clears throat> so Dr. before before Dr. Alexander, before you follow up with that. Um, I obviously agree that uh, the gospel is uh, is paramount to changing, right? So I know, Dr. Alexander, that, uh, that that's certainly the case. Is there anything else that we can do? Now, you, please feel free to talk about that, but um, is there anything else that, that we can do to complement, uh, obviously, preaching the gospel? Um, yes, uh, definitely, you know, as uh, we all believe in, um, you know, uh, good deeds uh, as a testimony to our faith in whichever way we can uh, to bring healing to the people around us and especially those who are going through poverty, those who are going through difficulties and those who are oppressed in whichever way we can, um, you know, uh, help them and show our love for them and to help them practically in their needs, um, you know, especially in relation to hunger, in relation to finding out jobs, in relation to honoring them and uh, helping them to uh, have, a, you know, a better uh, self-image about themselves and not to have the inferiority complex. These are men, some of the things which we can do through our ministries, you know, and um, uh, we should definitely make it a point to do that collectively as assemblies and whichever way we can do. But again, uh, and individually, probably we will be able to do it more uh, in various circumstances. But at the same time, we should not forget the fact that ultimately, and uh, completely, uh, there is no solution to this. And this problem will continue uh, because uh, of the evil world systems. As Dr. John Matthew said, some of these problems are perpetuated by uh, people who promote these evil systems, you know, as the po uh, poor social systems, poor economic systems, and uh, uh, that creates uh, all these kinds of uh, uh, social injustice also. Uh, so many of the systems that we see in the world today, even though they say that it is to help the poor people, actually they are not helping. They are actually uh, bringing more misery to the lives of the people. You know, I know many states in India where they claim uh, and also some states here in the United States and also in Eastern Europe where I have gone and see, you know, they make uh, they make big talks, the government, you know, but most of the politicians and the ministers there, their aim is to just amass wealth for themselves and not to help 
the people in any way. That is the problem with the socialist countries. You know, they get into politics, they want to win votes and they want to come into power. And the golden promise is that we will eradicate poverty and help everyone. But that has never happened in any of these countries. So ultimately, it is only when the Lord establishes his kingdom that these things will be completely eradicated. And until that day, uh, this will be a part of the evil cosmos, the world system that is under the domain of the evil one. But we can contribute to alleviate the sufferings and uh, the problems of injustice in uh, whichever way uh, we can. Maybe I would like to add, maybe this can be my final comment also, that is, you know, uh, it is our faith that will decide our core values. That is the big difference which we find today, which, uh, uh, you know, I find today. Uh, uh, this is a very deciding factor. It is our faith that decides our core values and our approach to issues and social injustice. How I will stand up, with whom I will stand up, and what are the world views to which I am committed. That makes a big difference. So, let me say that, you know, on my left side, there are a group of people who want to fight for social justice and who have good intentions. And on the right side, I'm here and a group of people with me. We all have the same agenda and the same goal, the same objective. But the difference is we stand on two different platforms. And because of that, you know, the people on my left side, they may not be very sympathetic or supportive to my attempt and my mission and my ministry or what I am able to alleviate, able to help in alleviating the problems because I operate on a different worldview of faith and of morality. And most of the social justice movement today have no faith, no morality, they, they promote transgenderism, homosexuality, violence, and uh, violation of law. That's what at least we have seen, you know. I'm not saying everybody is like that, but generally in the systems and the platforms, that is what we have seen. And we cannot be supportive of that. Our worldview is different. Okay, thank you, brother. Yeah, I know that um, there are probably many more questions about this topic and uh, certainly some specific questions that, that we can ask. This is a difficult thing to navigate. Everybody's looking for uh, an exact solution. Uh, and outside of uh, preaching the gospel and, uh, and then changing their lives from the inside out, uh, this is the only absolute that, uh, that we have to combat this. And as Dr. Alexander mentioned, we know that this will continue. Uh, so the other option uh, as an option that we have is, is perhaps to pray that uh, the Lord would come even tonight, that, uh, that the day would be hastened. So I know this is something that we can all look forward to. Now our time is, is up. Um, we will have opportunity uh, next week if there are any other questions for specifics and please send them in or have your questions ready. Uh, I feel that uh, there may be some the people that want to ask other uh, questions, so we want to we want to have time for that next session. We'll go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Uh, but first, just want to thank everybody for coming on, and uh, Dr. Alexander, appreciate uh, your time and efforts and in, in this very sensitive subject. And uh, Dr. John Matthew, uh, even though you aren't feeling very well, I appreciate it uh, that you were able to come on. I uh, just remember I was with you when you had brain surgery. And we were talking scripture, so the flu is not a problem. Uh, still expect uh, yes. the normal abilities, brother. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Uh, brother Paul, Paul Moffitt, can you hear me? Yes, I'll go ahead and close. Thank you, brother. Dear Father, we just thank you for this time that we had to 
study your word and to think about uh, various important issues of our times. Lord, just pray that you would give us wisdom. Pray that we would be uh, sympathetic to others, that we would be humble, that we would realize that we have no hope except through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, just pray that you would be with Alexander Curian and Sonny Matthew as they uh, give these seminars. Just pray for Sonny also that he would recover from the flu. Just pray that you would uh, bless our time tonight and be with us and preserve us from COVID-19. We pray this in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. You all have a wonderful evening. Thank you, too. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Very fun.